Welcome to the February 2015 version of the Goldson Monthly Webinar. My name is Nick Martin. I work at Goldson Technology Group. And today we're going to be going over modeling unsaturated flow using material delays. Um, feel free to uh, use the raise your hand button or uh, to ask a question using the little question dialog if at any point during this you have any questions or want to get my attention. All right, so what we're going to talk about today in regards to modeling unsaturated flow with material delays is we're first going to go through just a couple slides and talk a little bit about complexity in the Goldson modeling philosophy, uh, we'll briefly discuss unsaturated flow, and some things particular to Goldson in relation to unsaturated flow, like space and time in Goldson. And then we'll touch a little bit on the material delay element and wrap up with some example Goldson models uh, showing an example or two of actually modeling unsaturated flow using material delays. The, um, I think the one thing to point out here, and one of the reasons why there's a few slides here at the beginning, is there, there are many cases where Goldson may not be the best application to use to model or simulate unsaturated flow. Um, in other words, you know, we're not necessarily recommending that you try to avoid using or to replace using programs like Hydrus, Tough, VFlow, et cetera, with GoldSim. More, there are some situations where you can make some simplifications and use GoldSim uh, to present or to provide a very adequate representation for your particular model. All right, so starting out, and just we'll talk a little bit about complexity in GoldSim. Um, you know, a lot of the GoldSim model conceptual approach and philosophy is, you know, we want to make a straightforward and simple solution approach that catches the important details or dynamics of the system, uh, but, you know, no extra or extraneous details. Um, in contrast with unsaturated flow processes, uh, these processes tend to be fairly complicated, multi-phase, variance space and time, things like that. Um, so there is kind of a, you know, a little bit of a difference between the GoldSim sort of standard conceptual approach and what you would usually be done or might typically be done for unsaturated flow processes. Um, with GoldSim, we'll try to take a first order approach or maybe even a back of the envelope approach to simplify the complexity and try to represent the most important components as simply as possible. Uh, along with that, of course, there's always the adage that everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. Um, and, of course, the decision regarding the degree of simplicity that should be used in a model is one of the fundamental conceptual decisions made by modelers um, during the model construction. So the Goldson modeling philosophy is, you know, it's all oriented around the purpose of Goldson, and I guess the primary purpose and the main use of Goldson is to provide a dynamic probabilistic simulation tool which uh, guides decision making and can be used to conduct risk analyses. As part of this philosophy, you know, you always want to establish clear objectives for the modeling effort and then go through the process of decom decomposition um, the purpose of the conceptual model is to decompose the system into a series of linked subsystems that define the key components of the system, and then you can look at, you know, uncertainty and risk related to these various subsystems. What this leads to is a flowchart which kind of guides model creation, design, and representation. This image shows one of the uh, standard, or a flowchart from a mine model um, that's in some of the Goldson uh, mining related literature and I think the thing here is you know we have the different sort of objects or entities connected by flow arrows and so we'll come back to this in a little bit but this sort of flow diagram is you know very um, familiar to many Goldson users and that's kind of the way the model logic is structured and flow is stru often structured. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears briefly and just very briefly touch on unsaturated flow. Um, 
we're not really going to go into very many details on <laughs> the physics of unsaturated flow or uh, detailed pro process representation or anything like that, uh, but just to maybe reinforce the point that unsaturated flow can be very uh, complicated or very complex, um, showing this coupled equations for each fluid phase, uh, which are you know, often considered the most complete equations to describe unsaturated flow in porous media. Uh, you can see there's two fluid phases. The equations are coupled. It varies in space. It varies in time. Uh, fairly complicated set of PDEs. Then, in typical application, these PDEs would be solved in sort of a grid-based framework. And you can see an example of the grid there on the screen, or a typical grid uh, pulled out from some random model. Um, but these complicated set of equations, which vary in space and time, are used on a grid-based solution framework where spatial parameterization is important. So you can see the grid-based framework or model layout there on the screen right now. And I think it's a good idea just to con contrast that with sort of the Goldsim conceptual layout or the, our typical Goldsim conceptual layout. And just, it just I think it kind of reinforces the differences in philosophies, or not even philosophies, but the difference in approach in you know, the Goldsim type of model versus maybe a grid-based partial differential equation solving type model. So now we know that unsaturated, you know, we're going over unsaturated flow varying in space and time. And um, now I want to talk a little bit about cold sim in space because that's one of the uh, limiting or contributing factors in representing unsaturated flow in cold sim. So cold sim is dynamic, and as a dynamic simulator, it intrinsically understands time. Cold sim does not necessarily intrinsically understand space. And what I mean by this is if you think about, um, you know, trying to load a digital elevation model into GoldSim, for example, or maybe doing one of um, sp spatial, complex spatial calculations that you might sometimes do in a GIS software or a three-dimensional modeling software, like calculating the three-dimensional gradient, the divergence of the curl. Um, and so that's kind of what I mean you would have to think of a way to do this in Goldsim. It's not something where there's a button already to do these types of spatial operations. That said, Goldsim is a fairly general simulation and calculation framework. So the user could probably tell Goldsim about spatial variation by creating a spatial hierarchy, or by creating a hierarchy, and then telling Goldsim it's spatial related, um, using the built-in grouping and categorization features and facilities within the software. You know, in this point when we're talking about Goldsim in space, we're talking about Goldsim Pro um, in general here. There is actually a spatial component in the CT and RT modules. Um, and that spatial component is tied into some of the transport solutions. Uh, but within Goldson Pro itself, there is no built-in sort of spatial component or awareness. Okay? One of the rules of thumb that I often use with this is if you find yourself creating a spatial discretization where you're looking at some sort of spatial parameterization, the same thing, the same solution, and you're using more than, you know, five to ten different cells, nodes, containers or something, a lot of times it would be, you know, that's kind of a clue to yourself that it might be more easy or easier to do this particular application in another tool, a grid-based tool. Um, Again, there are many reasons why you might want to go ahead and do this in GoldSim too, and that's fine. Um, it is just more more work for the modeler than maybe a different tool would be. All right. So, coming back and sort of tying unsaturated flow back to GoldSim. So, flow is usually thought of or represented as varying in both space and time. We saw in the unsaturated flow equations that I showed a little bit ago that, uh, you know, those equations do vary in space and time. So for Goldsim then, we've also talked about space and time with Goldsim. The time part is no problem for Goldsim. You know, Goldsim intrinsically understands time. But the space part can often mean a bit of work for the modeler. Um, so, and it can be, you know, depending on how much discretization you might want to do, that could be quite a bit of work. 
So one way, one way to approach this, and especially with unsaturated flow, or flow in general, is to come up with an approach that trades space for time. And in this kind of approach, you'd use a time lag to represent the distance covered, or space, which then leads directly to the material delay element in Goldson. Okay? This approach, using a material delay element to represent flow, is for, you know, it's primarily intended, would be intended for advection-dominated systems. There are many scenarios where, for example, diffusion or diffusive transport would be important. Uh, you can also address these in Gold's Hymn, but there, you know, there might be some different ways you'd want to approach this. Uh, fortunately, there's a pretty, there's a really good article or discussion um, on our website provided by Neptune and Company uh, about the implementation of diffusion in Gold's Hymn, and you can find that discussion at the link shown here on the slide. Okay. So I'll come back brief and talk a little bit more detail about sort of the space for time approach. So what we want to do with this approach with flow is we want to take, and basically we're going to just use travel time rather than explicitly simulating the movement through space. We're just going to say, oh, it takes this amount of time for the flow to cover this distance. Okay. Um, while this seems like a fairly general simplification and maybe a very big simplification. It is one that's often used and did, if you want to get into sort of the mathematics of this approach or this substitution, uh, this is technically the conversion from an Eulerian to a Lagrangian frame of reference. Uh, this conversion is often represented mathematically with the change to the material derivative from partial derivative. Uh, there's an example equation of this approach shown here. It's um, just purely providing an example, and the point is just to highlight that this approach is used in um, more comp in complex models and in complex three-dimensional models. The equation set shown here on the page is actually the self-advection of momentum, um, as would be used in a three-dimensional solution for the Navier-Stokes equations. So, but back to the space for time representation. You know, what this is saying, essentially, is we're going to solve the material derivative component for time variation. Um, and in the equation above, that would be big DU over big DT for, for velocity, or U in that equation. But what we do here is, or conceptually, or fundamentally, what's done is you're following a fluid path line, or, or a particle path line, under the assumption that the effective quantity is constant along the trajectory of flow. While that may sound kind of confusing, really all we're saying is if you know the travel distance and you know the velocity, you can divide the distance by the velocity and get the travel time, right? And so then you have the travel time for the fluid, and you can use that simply as a lag approach um, to represent the actual flow. You could do this for unsaturated zone flow as well as for saturated and surface water flow. So, and this just is showing if a simple, you know, if the idea is you're using a characteristic, characteristic flow velocity um, along a particle path line, and that's how you're determining the travel time required to cover the distance by the particle. Uh, hopefully the graphical thing makes it a little clearer. Um, but then this application or this implementation, when we're talking about this in GoldSim, we're going to use the material delay element for this. And so we'll go over the material delay element briefly here. The material delay elements are intended to be used to simulate delays in the physical movement or flow of material. Um, one of the classic examples for the use of the material delay element given in our manual is flow of water through an aquifer. Um, there are several others given, but I figured that's probably the most representative example for the discussion today. So in the material delay element, uh, material is conserved as it moves through the element. The element then has two primary outputs. The first one is the lagged flow or outflow. Um, and this is just you put in flow on, say, the in input port or the upstream side of the element. The element holds that flow for specified lag time, and then it outputs the outflow. 
after the lag time. The secondary output for this element is the amount of material in transit within the element. And so this is where the mass conservation comes in. You can always see how much stuff is backed up in the element waiting or is in transit along the path line in this particular case. All right. So now that we've sort of talked briefly about some conceptual things and you know how unsaturated flow is fairly complex and with Goldson we're usually trying to you know make a straightforward approach and you know approach the the complexity using subsystems and things like that. Let's go ahead and look at a example Goldson model or two, uh, which provides this sort of representation of unsaturated flow that I've discussed in the preceding slides. Okay, give it a second to come up here on your screen. All right, so this is a um, Goldson model. Uh, this is a basic column model for unsaturated flow. We'll be solving the vertical unsaturated Darcy's equation here. You can see this equation on the right side of the screen. Um, this was equation was you could use other unsaturated flow equations in Goldson if you liked. Um, and I think it would be obvious as we go through this approach how you might substitute a different representation if you were interested in that. So here we have the column. Okay, The idea in this simple model is that there's discharge onto the surface of the column and then vertical flow out the bottom of the column. So what we're using is this path line, which is the material delay element in this case, to represent the travel through the column. And so basically we'll put in the discharge on the top to the path line. It'll hold it for the calculated travel time through the column and then let it come out the output port of the path line just as if it was coming out the bottom of the column. So the key thing here with the path line element, and I'll bring the element up, you can see we have the discharge through the top is the input, and then the output is going to be that discharge given the delay, the calculated delay for travel time. So the, there's two inputs here, discharge in the top and then the travel time. And the travel time is where we're trading space for time, essentially. So you can see with the unsaturated Darcy's equation, we have specific discharge, uh, which is this Q here. Um, and that can be converted to the average linear velocity. Um, and so that's what's used, that average linear velocity is used to calculate the travel time based on the travel distance. Okay? So that would just be the travel distance, which is Z1 minus Z2, divided by the average linear velocity. We have that travel time. Um, you can see for the start of this simulation, the travel time would be about 8.8 .8 days. This will vary. Um, this travel time will vary during the simulation because I put in a stochastic here and this drain down is purely um, used in the degree of saturation calculation. So we're just saying, oh, it's not completely saturated. It's some random departure each day from complete saturation. You might wish to do a different approach for this in your actual in an actual unsaturated flow model, but um, it provides an easy way to sort of illustrate this process here. So we have the distance, basically the travel distance, divided by the constant travel velocity to give us travel time. And then we use plug that into the material delay along with the um, discharge on, or the input discharge on the top of the column. And we'll get out the flow to the under drain in this case. So I'm going to run this model real quick. And we'll briefly look at some results here. So this result is just showing essentially the inputs and the outputs from the material delay element, which is named path line in this case. The green line is the volume in transit, so you can always see the volume that's held within the material delay element. So that would be the secondary output. The blue line is the input discharge, and the red line is the 
output discharge over the delay. You can see it runs for 100 days, so it's a little hard to see the delay. But if we bring up the table, you know, you can see that, oh, after eight days, you start to see flow out. So it's holding it for, you know, somewhere in the range of seven to nine days. That amount of time is varying stochastically somewhat based on the parameter I gave it. Um, but you can see it is basically lagging about eight days throughout the outflow. And that's what's shown in this plot. Okay, so that's a fairly simple 1D model of unsaturated zone flow. So I'm going to go and present now a little more complicated model. Again, we're going to keep the unsaturated flow processes represented in a simple and very similar fashion. Uh, but basically, we'll use multiple columns to represent a sort of a little bit more complicated scenario. Okay give this model a second to come up on your screens. Okay, now it's up. So this example model, if we're looking at drainage through, random, through a random order of irrigation plots. In the plan view here, you could see this would be plan view looking down, say, on the top. This big square represents the whole irrigated area. The idea here is these plots are irrigated for a week at a time. Um, and then there are 25 total plots. Each plot is hypothesized to be 10 meters by 10 meters. And then what we're looking at is if you change the order of irrigation under the assumption that each plot has to hit once, but their order could be random before you restart the shuffle through the 25 plots, you know, what do you see for outflow from the system? The outflow would be is in this application is targeted as outflow at this outlet represented here. So for the unsaturated flow component, which again is fairly simple, we have the typical column, the same thing we saw from the last model. Again, we're using a material delay to represent or simulate the transport or the movement of the fluid through the column. The one thing to note here is in the previous example model we looked at, we just had the column, and so we just had vertical flow. In this case, we're hypothesizing that there's vertical flow from the top of the structure to the bottom of the structure, and that's vertical. And then once it hits the bottom of the structure, it gets in an underdrain system, which would then flow horizontally to the outlet. So there are actually a compound flow path, we'll say. A portion of the flow path that's vertical, and then a horizontal portion out to the underdrain. So, in this application, then we're going to use two. We're going to use a compound travel time. You can see the equation coming up there on the screen. But basically, that compound travel time is just the vertical distance travel time plus the horizontal distance travel time. And to do that, we just need the vertical distance traveled, horizontal distance traveled the vertical velocity, and the horizontal velocity. Um, in this case, the vertical distance is just given by the elevation difference from the top to the bottom of the column. The horizontal distance is calculated beforehand based on each of these 25 plots. Each plot has a horizontal distance, which is hypothesized to correspond to the center of the 10 by 10 plot. So you can see these are entered in a vector at the beginning of the simulation. So you can see the horizontal distance for plot 1 is around 64 meters, and the horizontal distance for plot 5 is around 7 meters. So that gives us this horizontal distance. It's just the selection from that vector based on the current irrigation plot, and it gives us the vertical distance. Uh, we we're calculating the vertical velocity in the same way as the previous model. And then the horizontal velocity is specified using this typical drain velocity, which is just a somewhat randomly selected number in this particular case. Okay. So then our path line, our delay, is again using the travel time, but now it's the travel time from the top of the soil, from the top of this column to the outlet you know, the downstream outlet at the edge of the, at the, edge of the whole domain.
one other thing in this model um, is that I wanted to go through or select my irrigation plots randomly and run a Monte Carlo simulation looking at you know these random selections and some statistics of the outflow and in this case I'm just calculating statistics basically for the average outflow over a one-year simulation as well as for the standard deviation or an estimate of the variance of the outflow. The uh, simulation is one year and there are 25 plots. Each plot is irrigated for a week. So you can see there's 52 weeks in the year. We'll get through the plots twice and then the first two plots will be done three times for the full 52 weeks. To choose the random sequence, I have a submodel that runs before each realization. And that's this irrigation sequence submodel. And all it's doing is going through and randomly selecting or creating a random order of those 25 plots. Um, it's doing this with a looping container, which is just selecting, a, you know, selecting a plot number randomly, and then it looks to make sure that has not already been selected, so that basically we have selection from their array of 25 plots um, without replacement to get a. Um, you know, a series of the 25 plots where each plot is only once in a series of 25. Okay, so this random irrigation sequence is selected at the beginning of every simulation. Then the simulation runs for a year based on that random sequence. The simulated outflows are collected. Some statistics are done in these outflows at the end of the simulation, and that's what this submodel is purely just to calculate the standard deviation of the outflow after the realization is over. And those stats are collected into these result elements. Then the, real, then the next realization comes up. Again, we, we select a new random irrigation order for this realization, run it for a year with that order, and do the statistics after the realization before starting the next realization. Okay, So this is a Monte Carlo model. I can show you the simulation settings. It's one year, 52 weeks, 500 realizations. So I'll run this model now. Okay. So now we've run the 500 realizations. You know, we can look at the outflow. So this is the time history of the outflow. I'm showing the probabilities, actually, for each day. And you can also, we can all, you know, there's a variety of things we can look at, how the amount of transit translates, and the input discharge, things like that. But maybe more important or more interesting for this particular case would be some of these outflow statistics. And so this is for each realization. And so if I was interested in, oh, what irrigation order, randomly selected, provides me with the maximum average discharge, that would be realization 462 here. I can see that's the maximum. If I was interested in which one provided me with the smallest variance, that would be realization 224. And so we can then go look at those two sequences just to kind of see what's there for the sequence. This array plot shows the sequence. You can see the sequence selection here. So let's see, 224. You can see that's the sequence. So the first order, first one is plot 2, then we go to plot 18, then plot 25, then plot 13, and so forth through the thing. Again, we go through that order two times with the first two. The first two plots hit three times. Okay. We can also look at the one that provided the maximum discharge. And that would be realization 462. This one starts with plot 7, then goes to plot 17, then plot 19, and so forth through the rest of the simulation. Okay, um, the one thing having this, the idea here would be then the average outflow. You could use that along with your expectations on the variance to help you size if there was any sort of detention storage you needed 
uh, beyond this outlet as part of a recirculation system or something like that. Uh, these sort of stats would be useful for that design. All right, so those are the two sort of example models I had to show. Um, as I mentioned, it's a fairly um, simplistic representation of unsaturated flow, and the same sort of representation could be used for flow in general. Um, but in some cases, this would be, you know, all you would really need. Um, and in those cases, you know, there wouldn't be a point in going to a more detailed uh, grid-based model for these. All right, so that pretty much wraps up what I have in terms of presentation for this webinar. So I want to open it up and see if there's any questions anybody has, um, any comments. And we have a few minutes for that. Um, I will stay on the line to hand, handle any of those questions that may come up. Feel free to answer them. But uh, at this point, we're done with the formal presentation part of the webinar. All right, there's been a question on giving a quick overview of the dispersion feature of the element, and so I'll go over that briefly right now. Um, and then there's also another question as well. If I'll handle the dispersion element first and then move on to the retardation. All right, so dealing with the dispersion question, bring up the path line here, and let me go back to edit mode. All right, so by default, it's using a scalar delay time, which means a constant. Well, it's not constant in this case; it's a function, um, but it, which could vary in time. And if that varies in time, it always uses that value exactly. You could add dispersion here. Um, for example, you could add a standard deviation to the dispersion, and so this is just going to randomly um, add some. I guess dispersion to or spread out that travel time. So, you know, the delay time, specified delay time would still be the mean delay time, but there would be some random fluctuation away from the mean. Um, and that would be one way to, you know, incorporate some uncertainty into your flow times into the simulation. Um, you could also use an Erlang N. Um, which would be part of the Erlang distribution, and you could use that. It's, again, it would be randomly selecting from that distribution, um, and so that you would want to look at the properties of the Erlang distribution to choose the correct n value to get the amount of spread that you wanted. Okay. Um, so, if that, uh, if there's anything else you'd like to see on that, Brendan, uh, please uh, let me know, um, and I can be happy to cover any more of that. All right. So um, I'm going to go one more. I got another question or two here. But um, so the next question, we're talk there's a question about um, for contaminant transport, material retardation of a contaminate 
can be interesting. Can this tool handle this question somehow? So for the contaminant transport, um, the contaminant transport um, part of the GoldSim model, you can see, let's, if we look here, if you have, and I don't have CT turned on in this model, but let me do that quickly. So, if you turn on contaminant transport, you get a whole set of additional elements, right? These elements are designed to solve the advection dispersion equation, as well as reactions, including retardation. And so if you use one of these elements, you are actually used solving a different equation, the advection dispersion equation, rather than a flow equation. And in that case, you do actually have like a spatial component. Um, we have the cell networks, pipe pathways, aquifer pathways that would all incorporate the retardate. You could all use retardation on these, and these know about space. So because these know about space, you would probably not use the same material delay element. You could use the material delay element to, pu to purely represent delay, um, and it would delay, you know, all the your vector of species in a contaminant transport simulation, um, just as if they were purely advected, say, as plug flow. So you could use the material delay element to represent plug flow, but if you wanted to look at retardation, you would want to use one of these more specialized um, elements which have those capabilities and an understanding of space built into them. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to the next question, but if I miss something on that, please let me know. All right. So the next question is, can I show a comparison between the inflow and outflow of a cell that opens and closes? and show the curve of drain down. Can I show a comparison between the inflow and outflow of a cell that opens and closes? So for that particular one, um, the cell that opens and closes and the drain down, so with this approach I'm not actually, um, you know, you might if you wanted to look at actually the process of drain down and change in material and moisture content, you might want to use a slightly different approach, which would be based on uh, maybe incorporating a reservoir into the approach so that you would be, um, you know, actually track taking things in and out of the volume. Uh, the material delay element is conservative, uh, but it is basically just lagging a signal is one way to think about it. Um, and so for the rest of the um, question on the drain down curve, I would um, maybe Jesus, you and I can talk offline about that a little bit. Um, and I will get to you through a continuation of your question. Um, so I see you have a continuation of question. Um, when we irrigate a cell for five days, then resets without it 10 days more, and then for 10 days more, can you simulate outflow? So this is um, what we're doing here is in this example model to continue on this line of questioning, Jesus, is the um, is we're simulating the outflow here rather than the you know the total outflow at the outlet rather than the outflow at the bottom of each cell. If you really wanted the um, you know the lag at the or what you were happening in each cell then you would want to do multiple of these columns, basically, to individually track what's happening in each cell. So what we've done here is we've just aggregated this whole, using a single column, we've aggregated it to represent the entire domain, um, if that helps. Um, and again, we can uh, discuss this some more offline if you like, Jesus. And I'm going to move on to one more question, and then I'll come back to this a little more, Jesus. All right. I mentioned that the method is conservative. Does that mean that not that not even a decay is taking place with the material getting into the delay material element? In this case, it is totally conservative. There is no um, there is no decay happening in uh, the material delay element. The thing, if you did want to use decay, again, that's um, we're talking primarily here about unsaturated flow. Uh, 
Um, if you wanted to use decay, that would be more of a transport thing. And again, we would want to use um, the contaminant transport elements, which have, you know, first order decay uh, built in, or not built in, but you can specify first order decay as one of the processes that occur within these specialized elements. And so that would be a better play, a better way um, to approach the transport with decay or reaction. If you wanted, again, the material delay element would, you know, you conceptually would think of that as representing transport basically as plug flow or um, conservative transport with, you know, yeah, conservative sort of plug flow transport. Um, so if that, if there's something else on that, um, Zoltan, please let me know. Um, hopefully I got most of that uh, question for you. Um, Okay, so I think I got the questions there that have been asked. Um, again, I'll be on the line here for a few more minutes. If anybody wants to, has any more questions, feel free to ask them. Um, otherwise, I hope you have a good day. Okay, there was just another question about whether the slides or example models are available on our website. Um, they will all be available, uh, probably not until tomorrow, um, but they will all be available on the website. Um, in the webinars section, there's a past webinars thing, and so it will be available there.